I'm Lucinda Bateman. I'm here to talk to you about activity intolerance and pacing. This is going to apply to fibromyalgia as a fibro flare and also to ME-CFS as post-exertional malaise or illness relapse. So remember that the basic principles of management for fibromyalgia and ME-CFS are to have a good uh, relationship with your doctor so that you can sort through the differential diagnosis and identify and address all aspects of illness and comorbid com conditions that might be contributing to the symptoms of these illnesses. Then the primary intervention is all up to you. It's understanding how to pace your activity to prevent escalation of your symptoms. And this should be done in a preventive way as much as possible to avoid the push-crash cycle. So we'll be talking more about this throughout the talk. And then the other aspects of illness uh, are all very important. Restorative sleep, uh, balanced uh, mental health, managing pain, um, achieving the best fitness you can within the limitations of your illness, and if you have orthostatic intolerance, to uh, identify it and treat it. So in fibromyalgia patients, we often call an escalation of symptoms a fibro flare. And in ME-CFS, we call it post-exertional malaise or a crash. There are factors that can definitely worsen illness symptoms, and they vary on the spectrum of fibromyalgia to ME-CFS. And when I use the term fibromyalgia, I'm talking about an illness characterized by widespread pain amplification um, that may or may not have the degree of fatigue and disability that patients with ME-CFS have, whether or not they meet criteria for fibromyalgia. And um, you may find yourself at some point along this spectrum, uh, even in what, at different times in your life, uh, be more like one or more like the other or both. Now, they have uh, fibromyalgia and ME-CFS have many things in common, including that disturbed sleep can worsen symptoms, stress or uh, duress can worsen symptoms. Um, one of the differences between fibromyalgia and people with ME-CFS is um, the amount of activity that will flare or worsen your illness. Most patients with fibromyalgia uh, find that after four, uh, you know, four to eight hours of activity will flare their, their pain and the fatigue and the package of symptoms that are part of their illness. But patients with ME-CFS may have very little tolerance for activity, more like zero to four hours of physical, cognitive, or orthostatic stress um, tolerance in a given day. Um, both illnesses can be characterized by sensory sensitivity and sensory overload. There's a little difference usually in the way medications are tolerated. On the fibromyalgia end of the spectrum, it's much easier to address uh, many of the symptoms with medications and find them helpful, whereas ME-CFS patients may have difficulty tolerating the side effects of medications and utilizing them to improve their symptoms. Fibromyalgia is worsened by being very inactive and not moving and improved by getting the body in motion, doing uh, activity and gradually building physical conditioning. It really, uh, those who do it understand that it really helps improve many of the symptoms of fibromyalgia and they come right back if the exercise is abandoned and the sedentary behavior is again the focus. On the other hand, people with ME-CFS may really not tolerate uh, an escalation of attempts to exercise and rather have to function within a very small energy envelope to avoid, um, to avoid relapse symptoms. And I think people with ME-CFS are more sensitive to other kinds of stressors like infections, allergic responses, and other exposures that can dramatically uh, increase their symptoms or put them in a relapse or flare of illness. So how do we know that people with ME-CFS can get worse with exercise? Because we, there's a lot of literature that shows that becoming more physically fit in almost every way can improve fibromyalgia symptoms in people who don't meet, uh, also meet criteria for ME-CFS. So in this uh, discussion, I'd like to talk to you about four areas of science that have shed light um, on 
why people with ME-CFS have trouble um, exercising and engaging in activity, even cognitive activity. First, we're gonna talk about gene expression. And this is close to my heart because uh, I have worked on research with doctors Kathy and Alan Light for many years. And initially, our focus was on uh, a science called gene expression. You don't need to understand very much about gene expression to be able to appreciate uh, some of the slides I'm going to show you. But I do want to say, this is a picture of a cell. Uh, there's a, the DNA within the nucleus, and we all know that the DNA is the, uh, the template of all of our, uh, everything that needs to be made in our body is made from the template of the DNA. What most people might not know, if they're not sort of a science geek, is there's, uh, the, the DNA opens up and something called messenger RNA takes a perfect uh, match of, of, a, of a single gene and it goes out into the outside of the nucleus and into the cell to be constructed into the proteins needed in the body. With the technology of gene expression, we are able to measure the amount of messenger RNA being made at any given time for any given gene, or at least the genes that we choose to study. Uh, so this is a picture here in the red circle of a, a piece of messenger RNA uh, that uh, can be, that it reflects a single gene um, and is in transit. This is happening in an ongoing and rapid way in your body for many genes uh, while your body is um, encountering stress or doing physical activity or using receptors or any other process in the body. So briefly, um, Alan and Kathy Light designed a study of people with ME-CFS and exercise intolerance using gene expression and using exercise as the stressor to see if uh, what the consequences of exercise would be on the expression of numerous genes. Um, so what we, the, the plan was to uh, exercise the patient um, on an airdyne bike, as you saw, at 70% of age predicted heart rate, but for a rather extended time of 25 minutes. And uh, for example, a 50-year-old would exercise at a heart rate of approximately 120 beats per minute uh, for the 25 minutes. And each patient had their blood drawn before the exercise, we call that baseline. Then they exercised for the 25 minutes and their blood was drawn four more times, 30 minutes after the exercise, eight hours, 24 and 48 hours after the exercise to see what the activity of the gene would be in response to the exercise. This slide shows the gene expression markers we chose to measure in our patients. There were four markers involved in sensation or the sensory system for sensing pain and fatigue. There were four um, markers or receptors of the adrenergic system. Remember we talked in a different uh, setting about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And we also looked at five markers of immune activation or signs that the immune system was uh, being stressed. Here were the results of the healthy deconditioned controls. So just to get you so you can read these quickly, um, the first, the flat part of this curve is the baseline draw. The arrow shows where the exercise was performed, and then there are four blood draws uh, at these different intervals after the exercise. And you can see that in these healthy controls, there's a little bit of increase in a number of those different genes listed on the right side. You can coordinate with the colors. Um, but here's what happened in the patients who had ME-CFS and exercise intolerance. You can see the baseline value of messenger RNA, the time of the exercise, and after the exercise, a dramatic increase in the expression of all those genes across the sensory, adrenergic, and immune systems. This was very important because uh, this was one of the first, uh, this is one of the first scientific papers to demonstrate this physiologic response across multiple systems to a single bout of modest exercise. 
This was also looked at in patients with MS who have tremendous fatigue. And other than that one outlier, they really did not have this kind of a pattern with their fatigue and exercise intolerance. And the test was done also at high intensity in healthy controls to see if exercising even harder could create that kind of gene expression. And you can see that intense exercise brought the gene expression up a little bit, but nowhere near um, the response that our MECFS patients had to this single bout of exercise. Within the group of people who underwent this study uh, was the patient on top and you can see that her gene expression was very, very dramatic at each of the blood draws and actually uh, looked the most intense at the, and maybe the worst at the 48-hour mark. The middle graph are the, the MECFS patients with a smaller y-axis and the normal controls are on the bottom. So you can see this, and this patient was the most symptomatic, the most impaired, and had the most uh, difficulty uh, doing this uh, gene expression study due to her illness severity. Here's another patient. So the controls, the, the non, uh, the, the healthy people are on the bottom, and there's one patient on the top that mainly had a big increase in the and adrenergic 2A receptors, those uh, deep purple, uh, and you can see that they peak at eight and 24 hours, and are starting to come down by the 48 hour mark in this patient. This patient took us by surprise because we didn't realize that there would be a decrease in gene expression, but this patient had a marked decrease in gene expression as measured at all four blood draws after the exercise stressor. If you can see the purple uh, bar goes downward in, in his case. And this helped us realize that we might need to measure whether the genes go up or whether they go down in our graphs. After reanalyzing the data, we found that about one third of the patients had that down regulation of the adrenergic 2A receptors, and about two thirds of the patients had a more global increase in gene expression as a result of the exercise stressor. And this was true whether or not the patients uh, had chronic fatigue syndrome alone, MECFS alone, or whether they were MECFS patients who also met fibromyalgia criteria. And I put the pink arrows in to show you uh, that, that uh, the ASIC3 receptors um, are associated with the, uh, with the pain, and can, you can tell the difference between CFS patients without, who don't meet fibromyalgia criteria, and the CFS patients who also had the telltale sign of the pain amplification, in addition to falling in those two, two groups. So just to show you some individual uh, gene expression examples, this was a 20-year-old patient of mine who became ill as a teenager um, and met criteria for both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. He also had marked orthostatic intolerance. And you can see his gene expression on the left compared to the healthy controls on the right at those four blood draws following the exercise stressor. Here's a 22-year-old woman, very ill, um, getting on with her life, meets criteria for both MECFS and fibromyalgia, and you can see that she has uh, many genes that are very upregulated and many genes that were downregulated as a direct result of the 25 minutes of exercise compared to healthy controls on the right. What surprised us is we looked at patients who met fibromyalgia criteria but not MECFS criteria and their gene expression looked similar to the healthy control patients after exercise. And this graph uh, is published in uh, one of the papers, but it shows you side by side the, the look of the gene expression of the healthy controls on top, the, the two-thirds group that had upregulation of their genes, the one-third group that mainly had a downregulation of adrenergic 2A, and the fibromyalgia patients on the bottom who didn't meet CFS criteria, and you can see they look very similar to the healthy sedentary controls. Maybe look a little better than our healthy sedentary control patients. However, um, even though the gene expression was normal after the exercise, the, the fibromyalgia patients had changes 
had changes before the exercise was even um, it, it, before the exercise was even conducted. So there were at least three receptors that were different and more elevated in fibromyalgia patients than normal patients. And this is uh, helpful because um, it's a lot. It's a lot of work to do, and and some and some payback to do the exercise study. So this uh, has has led to the understanding of maybe cytokines and other kinds of markers for fibromyalgia. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about. Um, some additional uh, ways of looking at this. This is a single subject. The controls are on the left. The patient is on the right. You can see that her gene expression escalates, uh, peaks at 24 hours, and has not resolved at the 48-hour mark. Um, we also measured how people felt after doing the exercise. This is a graph showing mental fatigue before the exercise, in the middle of the exercise, immediately after, then, then the same as the blood draws. And you can see this one particular patient um, started out with very little mental fatigue, but her mental fatigue grew as the exercise uh, progressed and remained uh, for two days after the exercise stressor. This is the measure of her physical fatigue. So the red dots are the single patient, and in the background are the rest of the patients. She started with a pretty high physical fatigue score. Um, at, on the bottom are the controls. You can see their fatigue goes up just a little bit during the exercise, and then it's fine. Uh, hers goes up and stays up for a couple of days. And uh, so the lines on the bottom are the, the normal people. The blue lines, you can see that their pain. This is a graph of pain. Very little pain before, during, after, and this patient came in on a high pain day. Her pain got worse uh, after the exercise, stayed that way for about 24 hours, and then came back down a little bit lower than her baseline. So these are graphs uh, that are published in the Journal of Internal Medicine paper, but the top graph is mental fatigue, the middle graph is physical fatigue, and the bottom graph is pain before, during, and after exercise. And I'll have to help you see this fine print, but the lowest uh, line on, on the mental fatigue and physical, physical fatigue scores are the fibromyalgia patients who did not meet ME-CFS criteria. Um, and then uh, the more there's a combination of, uh, of fibromyalgia with the ME-CFS, uh, the more difficult it is to do this test. But the other thing, it, the other takeaway from this graph is that everybody struggles compared to controls. And it's, there's not that much difference in terms of how people feel across the entire spectrum uh, in terms of the fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, um, the alpha, alpha uh, adrenergic uh, 2A gene expression and the other gene expression. So now I want to just tell you a little bit about a little window into the, uh, the research that's going on that we hope will be published soon. Um, on the left are the controls. On the right is a single patient, um, 41. And you can see the gene expression of this person on the right. And you can see the three, three, and four uh, genes that we were measuring. Um, well, what we did, what Al and Kathy Light did next was to expand those panels. So instead of three sensory markers, they looked at nine. Instead of three adrenergic markers, they looked at 10. And instead of four immune markers, they looked at eight. Plus they added genes that are related to the function of mitochondria and your HPA axis. That's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So let me show you uh, the results in a single patient. On the left are the healthy controls, and on the right are the fatigue and pain genes. You can see they're quite different. The whole panel now, the expanded panel of fatigue and pain gene, gene expression following that exercise stressor. Here is that same patient. When we look at genes related to the sympathetic nervous system, you can see a big difference in the, the normal response of the healthy controls and the, and the patient who's sick on the right. These are the changes in immune genes, the expanded panel, the healthy controls on the left, and our patient number 41 on the right. How about genes related to mitochondrial function? Again, 
a bit of difference in the response to the controls on the left and patient number 41 on the right. And this is part, this one's pretty amazing to me. Uh, so the healthy controls, gene expression on the left, and the, ex the gene expression after the exercise stressor of our patient, number 41 on the right, after the exercise stressor, genes related to the HPA axis. That's enough about gene expression. That's still in the research stages. We hope someday that th that information will lead us to better understanding. But the most important thing is it's a scientific, uh, scientific test that shows there is a consequence in ME-CFS patients for pushing their body uh, to do more exercise than they're, than they're capable of. The second area of science that's very interesting is cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Studies using cardiopulmonary exercise testing, or CPET, sh have shown that people with ME-CFS are unable to replicate the test parameters if the test is conducted two days in a row. In other words, on day one, this, in this graph, the healthy controls are, are the blue lines um, and have a certain amount of oxygen consumption or energy consumption um, in test number one. You can see that the ME-CFS patient in the red was a little lower than the healthy controls, but not, not particularly abnormal and maybe not much worse than someone who's very deconditioned. But when the, the test was re uh, repeated the next day, when the, the patient had not been able to recover from the first exercise stressor, you can see a big difference in the ability to replicate the that, that test. And this is not related to effort. This is related to uh, the metabolism of the patients with ME-CFS and the post-exertional malaise or the consequence of the exercise on day one negatively impacting their ability to perform the test on day two. This was also replicated um, in, in, a, in a more recent study with a, f with a few more patients. And this, this uh, graph is kind of small, but um, just look at, uh, you don't even need to know what all these exercise uh, testing parameters are, but the dark bar is the score of the ME-CFS patients on day one, and the light gray bar is that parameter on day two and almost many, many parameters in the cardiopulmonary exercise test uh, were, were reduced uh, on day two. And this has become one of the most important scientific studies to show that exercise causes, uh, excessive exercise may cause physiologic harm to patients with ME-CFS. I wanna talk a little bit about orthostatic intolerance and how it might impact activity uh, tolerance. Um, we're not exactly sure how it contributes to post-exertional malaise, but I think it's very possible that when the patient is orthostatic or stand up and the blood pools, that there may be reduced blood flow to the brain when you stand too long or stay upright too long, and this can result in payback symptoms later as part of post-exertional malaise. You might be a little interested to hear about these scientific studies. Um, these, uh, these pictures I'm going to show you uh, relate to the work of Dr. Marvin Meadow and Julian Stewart and Ben Nadelson. I thank them for letting me use these slides. Um, they use tilt table testing, as you can see in the diagrams or in the pictures, where the patient is secured to the table and then the, tab the head is elevated on the table to, uh, to, to stress the body in an orthostatic position. And then they are able to do many physiologic measures, including heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, um, the, uh, the intake of oxygen and the, and the exhalation of carbon dioxide, and also measuring the blood vessels in the skin and the blood flow in the brain. So, um, again, this is a little tiny graph, but I want it that the top uh, graphs are the control patients or healthy patients, and on the lower level or are the chronic fatigue syndrome patients who also have POTS. The red lines are when the tilt, the table went up into the tilt position, and if you can just extend those red lines down to the lower graphs. So when the table goes up, the heart rate goes up a little bit in healthy people, 
But if you look below that, there's a big jump in the POTS patients in their heart rate while the table is elevated. And as soon as the table comes down, the heart rate comes down. Look at the respiratory efforts and the respirations. Um, The healthy controls, a little bit of change in their breathing during the tilt, but the chronic fatigue in POTS patients develop very chaotic and, and distressed respirations, and in the last shows that they, their uh, end tidal CO2 or their carbon dioxide levels go down and down. This can create symptoms during the tilt. Below, um, this is just where does the volume go when the table goes up? And the red, the, the white bars show a decrease of volume in your thorax and an increase in volume in your abdomen but it's very exaggerated in the MECFS patients. You can see those are the red hatched bars that a, a much larger volume leaves the thorax and goes down into, it, it says splanchnic, but that's the abdomen. So this shows some major fluid shifts during the tilt that are exaggerated in patients with, with CFS and POTS. This is a graph that shows the blood flow in the brain during the tilt table test, those little arrows on the graph show when the table was tilted and when the tilt ended. Um, The the dark lines are the control patients and the gray lines are the POTS patients. The top graph is the arterial pressure. You can see that as soon as the table is tilted that the people with POTS have a lower uh, arterial pressure in the brain which normalizes when the tilt is finished. And then the bottom graph, this is actual blood flow or cerebral blood flow. As Soon as the table is tilted, the blood flow is lower in, in the brain in patients with POTS and CFS compared to the normal controls. Well, next I want to talk about very briefly some new science called metabolomics. These are studies that look at the many, many molecules of metabolism that are in our bloodstream that reflect the metabolism of our cells. Uh, This was one of the first papers that came out talking about low metabolism in patients with MECFS. And there have been many since. I won't take the time to go into the science here, but this is very promising and it's proof of the really low battery and the low, uh, the low Uh, energy production at the cellular level that probably impacts people's ability to do cognitive and physical work without consequence. Now I'd like to talk about pacing, to avoid a fibro flare or to avoid post-exertional malaise. Pacing means knowing the threshold of the pain flare or relapse, knowing when, when, what level of activity will create relapse symptoms, and spend most of your time below this threshold. Staying below the threshold while gradually improving capacity may gradually move that threshold up and allow more capacity over time. I'm pretty convinced that people who live in uh, fibro flare and post-exertional malaise, uh, during that time it's very hard for your uh, capacity in general to improve. So let's use an analogy. If healthy people get $10 a day in energy and you have only a dollar a day, how are you gonna spend it? You can spend that dollar all at once and you can go beyond in terms of your activity, go into debt and have a very big crash and delayed recovery. Some people do that every day. Uh, They go till they drop or they go till they know they should stop and keep going, and then they have a a big payback later in terms of illness relapse. Um, So you could spend it all in the morning and then not spend any more. You can divide it into two 50 cent expenditures, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. You can divide it into four small activities, or you can do uh, 10 activities, little activities with rest periods that take you gradually through the day. It's all the same, it's still $1. So pacing, the concept of pacing is to limiting your activity to your $1 most of the time, to spread the activity out throughout the day, 
to engage in recovery behaviors between the activities that might be resting, putting your feet up, consuming fluids, meditating, something that allows your cells to stop working for a short period. It's very important to avoid debt. And debt means you've spent more than your dollar and that's uh, in the red. It's like, uh, it's like putting things on a credit card um, and you really won't feel normal until you pay off the debt. You won't come back to baseline and you probably don't heal very well and can't improve your function while you're in debt. Pacing is also an awareness that when debt accrues, it should be paid off as soon as possible and completely. It's also being mostly in a preventive, not a rescue mode. This is a very important concept. That means you try to understand how to prevent post-exertional malaise rather than just waiting until you cr it's created and puts you down and then you have to wait and get better from it. And then understand the concept is about earning interest instead of paying interest, uh, which raises that threshold of relapse and reduces symptom symptoms in general and may put you on a path toward more, more healing and at least more stability. I believe firmly that pacing reduces the frequency and severity of post-exertional malaise and maybe improves prognosis in general. So do the amount of activity that doesn't induce post-exertional malaise for more than 12 to 24 hours. The ideal is feeling back to baseline the following morning after a night of sleep. If post-exertional malaise is induced, you should rest and recover until it resolves and you're back to baseline. You should develop a heightened sense of awareness about that threshold of relapse for you and the consequences of pushing beyond it, which may be very individual for you. And don't be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid of post-exertional malaise. Be in charge. The more you understand about that threshold of relapse or how to spend your energy and how to recharge your battery, the more successful you'll be at uh, at managing your illness and having the ability to do more things that you would like to do. I think self-monitoring is a great idea. Getting some kind of a, of a, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something that helps you monitor your activity, the number of steps you're able to take, your sleep patterns, and your heart rate. All of those things can be an indicator of, uh, of things going on with your body that can inform you about how to do better pacing. This is an example of, of the number of steps per day. As recorded on a Fitbit, on the left is the patient who knows about how many steps they can take every day consistently without relapse. And on the right is the person who pushed too hard for two days and crashed for the next three days. That's not pacing. M many people who are very self-observant can learn to estimate their uh, average tolerable number of steps a day and can use their Fitbit to guide them when they should rest and when they should, uh, should limit their activity. Even though it's super important to pace your activity, e even if you have fibro, to understand how to do activity without generating a lot of pain amplification and how to rest and, and how to pace yourself, all the way on the spectrum to ME-CFS, where that activity tolerance may be very low when pacing is critical, critical for avoiding disease worsening and advancing disability. On the other hand, you, you have to remember that the more you can stay fit, the more you can keep your muscles strong, your mobility, your flexibility, your balance, the better off you'll be as long as you don't trigger illness relapse. We know that being more fit reduces falling and injuring, it increases general function, it reduces fatigue and uh, can improve or worsen pain. So you have to be, be careful. Um, being more active definitely can help, help sleep, help mood and self-esteem, and helps prevent that, the, the tendency to gain weight when it's very, very uh, inactive and unable to tolerate. Uh, the kind of activity that would help with weight gain, with, uh, to pre prevent weight gain. So, and remember, there's many kinds of fitness, right? Stretching, strengthening, 
light aerobic activity, these must be completely adapted to the individual and relapse symptoms should be avoided. And remember that some patients at some times have limited ability to do any physical activity and that even cognitive activity and sensory input can cause post-exertional malaise. So just to sort of expand your idea about conditioning, remember um, stretching, range of motion, and balance activities are a good place to start and they require less exertion. If you have orthostatic intolerance, you can do them seated or uh, even lying down. Um, I'm a big fan of strengthening your muscles and there are many ways to do that. You can do it with uh, weights, uh, bands, uh, you can do it with activities like yoga and Pilates and water activity, but getting your muscles stronger a little bit at a time is going to help you move around and carry yourself with, without hitting the wall. This is better tolerated than aerobic activity, so the first two should be your focus. Then to the degree that you're able to engage in aerobic activity, you should try to do it, but low impact, low intensity, and usually short duration. Um, and on, this, on the spectrum, people with fibromyalgia, as they increase their aerobic activity, they're going to feel better and better as long as they don't cause a bad flare of pain and fatigue from doing too much or too long. Some people with MECFS can do very little cardio and often use a heart rate monitor to estimate their anaerobic threshold and keep that activity very brief and very and, and not intense in order to uh, avoid relapse. Um, and also I would just say that it's try to remain aware of your weight because um, it can insidiously um, come on with poor eating habits when your ability to exercise is limited. The more ill and limited you are, the more methodical and strategic you need to be with your fitness activities. There are practices that are energy conserving, Feldenkrais, very low energy required, restorative yoga. You could do physical therapy uh, in a very strategic way if you have an informed and skilled therapist who understands your illness and the, and the consequences of activity. Um, I encourage people to design their own regimen at home so you can control the type, intensity, and duration. And you don't spend uh, precious energy going to a gym if you are very limited. You can find all kinds of uh, instruction on, on YouTube and on Netflix um, that you can use just at your pace and in, in the situations that are good for you. It's a little bit of trial and error. Um, you need to try an activity a little bit and then maybe have a rest day and observe and see your body's response and scale up or down in the, the duration or intensity of your activity um, based on whether or not you have a post-exertional malaise or pain amplification, particularly that is uh, lingering into the next day. It's important to reduce muscle weakness and establish adequate strength to engage in daily activities. And when you don't use a muscle, your muscle strength uh, will kind of lag down to the average daily demands. So um, you need to kind of get some uh, instruction but, or help if you don't know how to do it, but uh, maintaining uh, the strength of your muscles and also joint flexibility and balance will bring benefit even if you can't engage in aerobic activity. So these are the basics uh, of, of uh, management, pacing, right up there at the top, one of the most important things you can do to control illness symptoms and to improve your, uh, your general well-being. Remember that the four table legs are restorative sleep, a nice balance of mental health, reducing severe pain, and then being as fit as you can, as we've discussed, uh, to help give you that stability and reduce symptoms. And if you have orthostatic intolerance, that's an important thing to add to your management. Thank you, and uh, I, I wish you good luck. It's very individual about, about how to pace your activity and uh, have confidence that you can do it. Um, these are the other classes that we've filmed and could be a resource to you, so I welcome you to take advantage of them if they're helpful.
Thank you.